all you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So uh, managing two screens here, so I can kind of try to keep. And so if you do have questions and stuff too, if you'll put it in the chat and or uh, raise your hand and Tana can help watch that and let me know if you guys have questions. Um, but uh, the class today is on indoor air quality. This is actually one of my favorite classes just because it's something that I've played around with a lot over the last decade and seen improvements. It's one where it's good information for you to know as an agent to help your clients, but also a lot of applicable information for you, just any homeowner, just uh, and overall improving your, your quality of life. Um, this is kind of awkward because I have to look at that screen. I'm looking you at can just, like I'm I'm just pretend like it. <laughs> so we're uh, so the so again, my name is Pil uh, Jared. I'm with Pillar to Post. We do home inspections. Um, I know you guys are all over the state. Pillar to Post has an office uh, down in Cedar City, St. George. I actually know the owner very well down there. Aaron Bell uh, does a great job. He comes up and uh, he's actually going to be up here next weekend with me. Um, but there's a Salt Lake City, Park City. Uh, Weber County, Northern Utah. And so my team mostly covers central Utah. So we'll go down to Ephraim, um, maybe Price, maybe a little bit further uh, Manti and, and some of those areas, but it kind of depends on weather and how busy we are. Um, but, and then North and Salt Lake and uh, Utah County is where we're usually doing our inspections. Um, a lot of the air quality stuff, we offer a lot of other services with air quality. So we're going to talk about some of those different things and where testing makes sense, whether it's us or other companies that can provide that. But that's what we want to kind of look at with this class is all of the things that are going to affect your air quality, what you're breathing. So uh, let's see if I can get my... <laughs> Okay, so the goal with, uh, with air quality is we want to get rid of the bad and get the good. And the problem is, is that a lot of people, when they think about that, sometimes they only focus on one of these. So, you know, reducing the contaminants, that's, that's one that most people think of. I need an air purifier because that's what it's going to do. It's going to remove those contaminants. Um, Sorry, removing them. Reducing is, oh, we just need to have less pollution. We need to use less harsh chemicals in our cleaning products. Diluting, that's uh, open a window, get some fresh air and dilute some of that. So those are all ways that you can improve air quality in a home. Uh, and, and we want to keep that in mind because sometimes we focus so much on one of them, like you know, reducing. Well, there's only so much you can do to reduce, like radon, for example, we're going to talk about there's not a whole lot you can do. It's coming out of the ground. You can move. And, you know, that's a great thing to talk to your clients about moving. That helps our business, right? But, uh, but that's not really feasible, but you can remove it. You can dilute it. There's other things. And so if you always keep that in mind when it comes to anything with air quality, um, that's kind of what we want to talk about. Now, why air quality? Why is it important? It really comes down to health. Um, it's, it, I think, part of what got me into a lot of this is uh, my daughter started having a lot of allergies when she was little. And then my son, um, well, eventually kind of end result is he had it, was born with really enlarged adenoids. So, you know, we eventually got those removed, but during that whole process of trying to figure out and just learning about how breathing affects things like sleeping and your quality of sleep. And, and there's all kinds of studies, especially with children, when you get into behavioral disorders and, you know, and, and they're now linking those to sleep, but then what is the sleep? And it's leading to whether it's screen times or blue light or breathing, all of those things, they're all related. And so if we can eliminate and deal with the air quality stuff, then we can start to notice some huge improvements. And that's kind of where I got into this. That's why I became very fascinated with this topic is I saw little things that we could do in our home wouldn't have a huge improvement for my daughter's ability with hay fever and, and things like that. Um, asthma, allergies, other lung conditions, as we talk about, uh, you know, radon and lung cancer and things like that. Um, a lot of people are affected by that. Um, people that are going to be more affected by air quality issues are obviously people who already have some sort of compromised breathing issue. So infants, small children, their system hasn't developed. You've got pregnant women who are kind of breathing for two 
or more. Uh, elderly, where maybe it's just not functioning as well as it used to. And so they're going to have even more of an impact when it comes to air quality issues and, and how it's going to affect their health. Uh, just some interesting information. Childhood asthma has quadrupled since the 70s. Um, more people are developing allergies and sensitivities. And, and there's a lot of, depending on which industry you go to, they're going to point to a different culprit. You talk to some and it's the different chemicals and the plastics and all of that. And you talk to um, you know, it's the pollution and it's all the air quality with all the vehicle. You know, so depending on which industry, they all have their culprit. Um, one of the ones that we look at a lot in my industry and in the real estate industry is just homes. And you look at how home design has changed from the 40s, 50s, 60s, and then after the 70s. And one of the biggest things you see is that at the 70s is when we started worrying about energy efficiency. That's when our homes started being built more airtight. You, you think of a 30s, 40s, 50s house that hasn't had any improvements. You think of old and drafty and poorly insulated. And that's kind of you know a, what we're going to focus on is that this has become more of an issue in the last three or four decades because we're building our homes more comfortably. We're not outside all the time. We don't open up the windows in the summertime to cool off the house, we close it up even tighter and crank up the AC. And so a lot of that affects the, you know, the overall air quality and our health. So um, when it comes to air quality, there are things that are both immediate and long-term. So immediate and short-term, you know, hay fever is probably the, the one that comes to mind the most for just that immediate. And then long-term, you have things like lung cancer from radon. And so when it comes to air quality, it is the short term and the long term that we should be thinking about. Um, every case is unique. That's the one thing to keep in mind. And, and I, if you've been to my radon class, we talk a lot about when it comes to air quality, everybody's immune system is different. And so how our bodies react to things is going to be different. Um, you know, take the case of smoking. Well, how many cigarettes do I need to smoke before I'm going to get lung cancer? <laughs> Depends on your genetics. It depends on so many other things that go into that because everybody's different. So again, this class is more focused on giving you a broad overview and every case is going to be unique, but there are going to be things that you can find that can make a huge impact in your own life. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the different uh, pollutants that we're going to encounter in a home. So all of these at some point or another, or to some degree, you are going to have in your home. It's just a matter of how big of an issue is it? And so one is understanding what it is so you can identify the problem. And then we can go through and talk about what are some of the things you can do and actions you can take to reduce those or eliminate them or basically improve your air quality by addressing each one of these things. So first, we're just going to go through and make sure we understand what the concept is. And then we'll go back and talk about improvements. So dust. Dust is a, is a big one. And a lot of times people think of dust as dirt. And a lot of times, especially if you live out in the middle, you know, rural Utah and dirt roads, yeah, a lot of that dust that's coming to the house is actually dirt. But in here in the city, there's not a whole lot of dirt flying around. I mean, every once in a while we'll get windstorms that will pick stuff up. But a lot of times the dust is other stuff in our house. One of the big components of a lot of dust in our homes is skin cells, which, uh, you know, you often don't want to think about too much, but it's skin cells and pet dander, which is basically skin cells from the pet. You know, all those kinds of things are floating around in our air. Allergens, um, again, not so much an air quality issue, but the thing to keep in mind, and this applies to a lot of these, is we have an immune system and that the purpose of our immune system is to protect us from disease, from damage to our, to our body. So there's things like the mucosa, the mucous membranes in our eyes, our nose, our mouth, and those things act as a barrier to prevent certain things from getting into our body. So you have sometimes where people's immune system is gone a little haywire. So for example, I'm allergic to cats. Are they damaging to me? No, but for some reason, my genetics determined that my immune system was going to put up its defenses whenever I'm around cats. So when I'm around cats too much, tissues start swelling, I start watering, I start sneezing because my body is trying to get rid of those allergens or those other things that are going to trigger an immune response. So there's a lot of things that can trigger an immune response in, the, in, in our environment. And depending on you, it's going to be different. So pets are a big one for a lot of people. One that a lot of people don't realize, but a 
big majority of the population is affected by is dust mites, which everybody has. Um, let's see, I think this next, yeah. So dust mites, um, not to be confused with bed bugs. A lot of times people, especially they see this picture and they think of bed bugs. Bed bugs are a total different yeah, thing. That's basically bed bugs or little organisms that get into your bed and suck your blood and you don't want those. Uh, dust mites, everybody has. If you have dust in your house, you have dust mites. Um, they're microscopic. This is an electron microscope. You are not going to see dust mites. They basically feed on skin cells. So the more dust you have in your home, the more potential you have for dust mites. Um, it is actually one of the most common asthma triggers. So a lot of, there's finding a lot of studies now that asthma is often triggered by dust. And it's not just the, the dust in the air, but it's actually the genetics of the dust mites that are triggering those. Um, there's actually two different kinds of dust mites that are common in households. And so that can be too why kids might have real bad asthma whenever they go to grandma's house, but not such bad asthma when they're at home. Well, there's different kinds of dust mites that might be triggering those allergens. Humidity. Humidity is not really anything that's causing air pollution or, or bad air quality, but it has a synergistic effect with other things. So for example, high humidity can cause mold to grow. Dust mites actually reproduce exponentially faster when the humidity is over 50%. You can get bacteria growth. So high humidity can trigger and accentuate or exacerbate some of these other things that we're talking about. Um, oh, I'm like, what does that have to do with? That's one of our first keywords. <laughs> Um, so first keyword is right there. Okay. Um, actually there was one more thing. I guess we talked a little more, but low humidity is also an issue. Um, our, that mucosa that I was talking about, part of our immune system, that mucous membrane acts as a defense. And when it's very low humidity, so like the winter time, so one of the arguments of why we see so much sickness in the winter time is because that mucosa isn't as wet and it doesn't act as good of a barrier. And so we're more susceptible to germs and things getting through. And so low humidity can also trigger more immune responses and, and more uh, adverse effects with, with some of the air quality things. All right, VOCs. Uh, volatile organic compounds. So these are chemical compounds. They're often found in cleaning products, uh, paint fumes, pesticides, perfumes. You've probably heard of people that have sensitivities to VOCs. Um, VOCs tend to, uh, well, with cleaning products, for example, when you buy a green product or something that's environmentally friendly, usually means it has lower VOC content. Some people are more susceptible. Um, they're also finding that once someone is exposed to a lot of VOCs, their body kind of builds up this allergy, this immune response, so it triggers it more frequently. Uh, VOCs, headaches, irritation of eyes, nose, and throat can cause skin reactions like hives um, or other rashes, nausea, fatigue, dizziness. Some VOCs are known carcinogens. Um, formaldehyde is one of those that, that we hear a lot about. Um, formaldehyde is a common product in a lot, of, a lot of building products. So the glues in our flooring, the glues in the particle board that's in the cabinets and the flooring and the, you know, all the wood trim nowadays is some sort of pressed board. And a lot of the resins used to hold it all together are formaldehyde based. And so those will off gas a lot in the first, uh, usually eight, 10 months of, of being installed. Um, just a side note here, we had a, did a, a multi-million dollar property up in Draper and about six, eight months later, the client calls me and, and we had done all the tests possible on this inspection. She calls me and said, hey, I, I'm just, I'm looking for one of these reports. I think it was, it was a mold report, a radon report that we'd done on the house. And, and so I started talking to her. She couldn't find the, the, the test and her doctor wanted it. And so as we started talking, um, she'd been sick for three or four months, just constant coughing and, and headache and just irritation in her throat and just was nothing was going away. It wasn't getting worse, it wasn't getting better. And she'd gone out of town for a week and felt great and came home and felt worse again. And so immediately, okay, it's something in the house and they're trying to narrow it down. 
They couldn't find any like sickness. And so, um, so her doctor wanted to start looking at some of the things in the home. And so they were looking at these tests. And, and during the inspection, I had remembered them being going around with a contractor and talking about all the renovations. So we started talking about renovations. And one of the things that had, so what, one of the things that they'd done is there was this huge bonus room above the, the garage. And, uh, and, and, and I said, well, tell me about the renovations. And there was this huge bonus room. And she's like, yeah, that's kind of my workspace. That's, you know, we, it used to be a playroom, but now it's my office and it has a ton of built-ins and all this cabinetry. And, and most of you have been in a lot of these bonus rooms. There's not a good air circulation. They're usually really hot in the summer, really cold. And so, so we started talking about that and I said, okay, well, have you looked into formaldehyde? And a lot of those products and things that you've installed, they're usually the worst in the first six months of, of having everything installed. And you could kind of hear the light bulb go on. She's like, wow. She's like, my son has been having some of the same symptoms. And we just figured it was the house in general. But in his bedroom, we did a huge built-ins and all kinds of stuff in the area where he you know, does most of his stuff down in the basement. And so we start to see that a lot, that there's this formaldehyde off-gassing. And so, again, when people, I've had a number of times over the years where people will call and say, hey, I want you to come test my house for mold or for meth. Because if you Google these symptoms, a meth house and mold contamination usually comes up. And so the first thing I usually ask is, have you done any recent renovations? And usually goes down that path. So it is something to uh, think about, especially with all the new building, new construction that's going on. All right. Next category is kind of just a generic category of very small par particles. So these are just smaller particles that are small enough that they aren't getting filtered through our, our nose and our normal um, system, but it's enough to get in there and cause problems. And so burning is like probably one of the biggest ones. Um, so if you're not a great cook, you know, that's one way to improve air quality is get some cooking lessons or install a nice hood vent. Uh, mold, we could go on forever talking about mold and all the issues, but mold is something that can trigger an allergic reaction. That's really the danger with mold is it causes an immune response for people. Um, you know, one thing people always hear of these horror stories with mold and, and one thing just to kind of put it all in perspective is how many people know of someone that has a penicillin allergy, you know, and what, what do we, we think about, well, yeah, if I get penicillin, I need my EpiPen, I could go into anaphylactic shock, I could cause all these problems. Well, guess what one of the most common molds is in house? Penicillin. So do you think that those people that have sensitivities to penicillin are going to have a reaction? So a lot of times it is just an immune response. Not that we're saying that it's not a bad thing. It's just, just because my aunt's friend's neighbor's daughter had a really bad reaction to mold in her house doesn't mean that you're gonna have the same issue. Um, main message with mold, and I say this all the time, mold for me is a symptom of a problem. Mold is not the problem, it's just a symptom. So solve the problem, you'll solve the symptom. Next category is radon. Radon is a radioactive gas, comes out of the ground, it's in all of your homes. All of you are breathing radon. You're not going to find a place on the planet where there is no chance for radon because it's, it's in our atmosphere. The problem is, is that indoor levels are starting to, we're starting to see more and more of it. We're starting to understand the damage that it can cause. But a lot of it is because we build our homes super tight. Um, I, luckily, it's been several years before I've heard this, but I used to hear from agents, oh, it's a new house. Don't worry about radon. It's actually the opposite is true. Newer homes that are more airtight are going to be more prone to radon problems. Leading cause of lung cancer after smoking. Um, and especially if you have smoked or have ever smoked or are smoking, radon has this synergistic effect that the chance for getting lung cancer if you're exposed to radon and you're smoking goes up significantly. Okay, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. So we often hear about these, we often get them mixed up. Carbon dioxide, you all are breathing right now. Carbon monoxide, you shouldn't be. Um, carbon monoxide comes from motors. It's a byproduct of combustion. Carbon dioxide is what you're breathing out. So, okay, we're breathing that out. Why is that an air quality issue? 
it, it is if your home is not breathing. So that's kind of one of the things you've probably heard the term sick house syndrome. A lot of that comes from if a home just is built too tight, it's not getting any air exchanges. So there's no fresh air ever coming in. And you can, and one of the ways they measure that is by buildup of carbon dioxide. It's more of an issue you find in um, commercial, in business places where carbon dioxide could be a problem. Uh, that uh, stuffy room feeling, I've been in a meeting for hours and we're in this little conference room and that stuffy feeling, that's carbon dioxide that's starting to elevate. Um, a lot of the casinos in Vegas to combat carbon dioxide, which causes some lethargy and just your brain not moving as fast, is they actually pump oxygen through the air conditioning system to help uh, reduce that. So carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide. Don't ever ask your inspector if there's a carbon dioxide detector in the house. There never will be. Are there any smart home features that are kind of coming to market that will monitor the exterior air temperature and somehow limit what comes in when the air temperature outside is so bad and or anything like that there, well, at the very end we're going to talk about some of the higher end technology okay. for improving fresh air it's called an hrv or an erv okay so okay. hold that thought okay um okay so just to wrap up we've kind of gone through all those points there's a lot of things that go into the quality of your air in your home. Obviously it's gonna be worse inside than outside because it can accumulate and you're not getting that dilution. Um, and then really just understanding that you get, that people are gonna be affected differently. So just because you feel fine, you know, we talked about different immune systems and people's differences, but the other one that we often don't consider is children. And when you look at pollutants and you take, for example, my, my son that's 60 pounds, I'm 200 pounds, he's getting a triple dose of exposure for his mass. A lot of pollutants, you rate them based on, you know, pollutant or, I mean, the same thing with drugs or anything. It's, it's the, the amount of the chemical to the mass. So per kilogram or per pound of a person, that's how they dose medications. Well, that's the same thing with pollutants and exposure to certain things is is based on your mass. So if I have a bigger mass, I'm a bigger person, I may not be as affected by these as much as, say, example, for example, a child. So when we, so understanding all of that, now we kind of flip it around and let's say, how can we improve things? And the good news is, is there's not a whole lot, there's tons of big things that you can do and spend a ton of money. But the reality is there's a lot of things that really don't cost anything. That sometimes it's just a change in perception a small change in behavior that can actually make a huge difference. When it comes to allergies in general and our immune response, there's this tipping point and allergens are usually cumulative. So our body mounts this defense and it's, you know, say, take, so take hay fever, pollen. I'm allergic to, to certain tree pollen. So does that mean I can't go out anywhere in the forest? No, but if there's certain pollens and they start to build up, my body's going to eventually go, okay, well, enough is enough. And we're going to put up the defenses. I'm going to start sneezing. I'm going to start, you know, things are going to start swelling to block off those, those inputs, those, you know, those openings where things could get into my body. And so there's that tipping point where our body reaches. And so different people have different tipping points. So same thing with cats. Like I said, my daughter is pretty allergic to cats. I'm allergic to cats too, but I'm okay being in a room with cat. As long as I don't touch the cat, as long as the cat doesn't really come in contact with my face, I'm, I'm okay. But at some point, um, you know, so every once in a while I'll be on an inspection and there's several cats in the house. And by the end of the inspection, my eyes are getting a little itchy. I'm starting to, starting to feel it a little bit, but there's that tipping point. Um, if we can, so if we're starting to feel the adverse effects of air quality because it's, it's gone beyond that threshold, we don't have to totally get rid of it. We just have to get on the other side of that threshold and we're gonna notice a huge improvement in just our health and our overall quality of life. Um, and so as we go back through here, you may have a lot of these things in your home and it isn't that we have to get rid of all the dust, but if we can just take it down a notch, we may notice some huge improvements. So back to kind of some of my own experience with my daughter, what we started noticing was when she'd wake up in the morning being all stuffed up and, and not sleeping very well because she couldn't breathe through her nose, 
we kind of do, okay, let's, we've reached that tipping point. You know, we'd lift up the bed, we'd shampoo and the, the cart, you know, vacuum the carpets underneath the bed and shampoo, we'd pull the drapes off, wash the drapes, wipe down the walls and just do a total deep clean of her whole room. And then it would, you know, she'd go back to sleeping better and, and getting better sleep. Um, so reducing dust, one of the best things you can do is get a better vacuum cleaner. If you think about how a vacuum works, it's basically using suction and air movement, and those particles need to get trapped in some sort of filter or container. But their air has to be going through. And that's actually what one of the benefits of a central vac. So all of you agents that are have these homes and you know it's got a central vac, which is not really a selling point in a lot of people's minds. Well, this is why is the benefit of a central vac is that the discharge is usually going to the outside of the garage. So it's not just picking up in what you're trapping, but everything else. Many of us have sat through the, the rainbow vac and, you know, presentations and how, and, and they'll even talk about how it's an air purifier. And the whole concept is all of the discharge coming through those vacuums are usually going into a reservoir of water, which will trap even the smallest particles so it is filtering out the air, but it's really no different than a good central vac. A central vac is doing the same thing. Now, aside from those bigger, more expensive systems, you can just get a nicer vacuum with a good HEPA filter. HEPA stands for High Efficiency Particle Accumulator. So it's just a better type of filter. The thing is that most people don't realize is that uh, that filter has to be cleaned or changed periodically. So I've seen some vacuums where it was every six months you were expected to replace it. Some of the, like I have a Dyson and it has a washable HEPA filter, but you should be washing that. It says every 30 days you know, or, or every three months. Um, kind of depends on what you're vacuuming and how dirty it gets. But what happens with that, it's a particle accumulator. And so it actually starts to work better as time goes on because the bigger holes get plugged and it starts filtering, but eventually gets so plugged up that it's not really filtering anything. The particles are just kind of bouncing and going around. It's not really trapping anything. So, you know, I always hear, oh yeah, we got this new vacuum and it works great. I can almost promise you every time you get a brand new vacuum, it's going to work better than your other one because it's just working better. Um, but yeah, maintaining your vacuum is important. So not only the vac, you know, the vacuum is probably the number one thing you can do to help reduce the dust. Fewer carpets. So again, another experience. This is where I, I kind of get nerdy just because I, you know, I, I do this for a living. I deal with all these kinds of things. And so one of the tests that we offer is an allergen test where we actually use a, a vacuum and a special little device connected on the end of it. And we vacuum up carpet and it pulls up all the dust. We send it off to a lab and they use DNA, DNA to, to match up and see what's in there. And they match it up with five of the most common allergen triggers. So you have the two different dust mites, cockroaches, dogs, and cats. So those are the five most common triggers. So I, you know, I've been offering that test for years. And I thought, you know, what? I wonder how bad carpet really is. So timeline, we remodeled some of our house, got new carpeting in our, in our uh, front room. Uh, we had uh, a lab and a Rottweiler, two big dogs. Uh, we kept them pretty clean, but, and then especially they weren't allowed in that front room very often because um, that was kind of the sitting room. That's where we'd have company. And uh, so <laughs> about a year goes by. Um, well, a few months after that, the Rottweiler passed away and it was about a year and then the lab also. And so that new carpet was only in the dog's lives for about a year. Um, during that time, around that time too, we got uh, two little kittens for my daughter. And, but again, she was kind of allergic, I'm allergic, but it was I think February when we got them and my wife says, no, they can't be in the garage. So we had them in the dog crate in the front room. And obviously I think my wife would let them while I was at work, they'd run around and, but not like living in the front room, but just that little bit over a couple months until they got bigger and then they kind of moved to the garage. So that's the animal exposure. Fast forward about six years where we're regularly vacuuming. We had one of those Hoover steam cleaners and we're regularly uh, doing the carpets. About once a year, we'd have a professional come in and, and just do all the carpets. So we're doing that regularly. 
Six years go by, I decide I'm going to do one of these allergen tests. After six years of all of that, I still get dog allergens. I still get cat allergens in that carpeting. So the idea that you can ever really clean out carpets is kind of a myth. Um, those carpets will always harbor some of that. Um, and then just dusting regularly is another big one. Again, it's often not the dust that causes the issues, but the dust feeds the dust mites and the dust mites is what triggers a lot of the health issues with people. Okay, so here's the other big one that I've, I've played around with a lot over the years. And this is your furnace filter. So back in this time when we, um, so when I first moved into our house 20 years ago, I'm the oldest of five. My dad's in construction and I bought a 50s house. So it was really nice when my parents came down to visit from Montana because I'd get dad to do a lot of work on the house. Um, they had a motor home, so they'd stay in the motor home out on the driveway on the street. Um, but what we found is because we had those two large dogs, my parents would come in. My mom, after about a half hour being in the house, would start to have some of those allergies. You know, <clears throat> she'd start cutting, her throat would start to get a little swollen, her eyes would start to get itchy. So at this time, my brother then decides to buy a house down in Provo. And I'm thinking, okay, if we don't figure this out, they're going to start staying at my brother's house. And it was an 1890s house. So he needed the help, but I was being selfish and I wanted dad to help us on our house. So we got to figure this out. We got to figure out how we're going to keep mom and dad here, staying at our house. And uh, so I started looking at room air purifiers. And let's say, well, if we get a room purifier, that's going to filter out the air, right? And then, then mom won't be exposed to some of those allergens. I came across an article that just talked about what is a room pur uh, an air purifier. It's basically a filter with a fan that blows the air through the filter and it pulls out those impurities. And it talked about how, why not leverage a system that's already in most homes, which is your furnace filter. And it talked about just uh, getting a little bit nicer, nicer furnace filter and turning that thermostat switch where there's a fan for on or auto and setting it to on. So it's running all the time. So we started doing that. We, and, and our furnace already had one of those compartments for the bigger filters. So we got one of those bigger filters. Um, and uh, there's actually, they make a carbon filter so uh, charcoal or carbon helps absorb. That's like your, your water pitcher, like your Brita pitcher. It has car activated carbon that helps pull out and filter out. It's like a sponge for, for impurities and water in the air. So uh, 3M and filter it, they make a, a filter that has activated charcoal. And it's usually one size fits all. You buy it, you cut it to the size of your furnace, you put it in. And it helps absorb a lot of odors. So tip, I would recommend a lot of your listings where they have those funky smells, rather than putting the air fresheners all over the house, get one of those filters and you're just letting the air circulate through that. It will help remove a lot of those smells. Um, the air fresheners usually, when there's a lot of air fresheners covering up something, the client or the buyer, when they first show up to the inspection, they're like, what are they trying to hide? <laughs> so just get rid of the odors, don't cover them up. So we did that. We put that charcoal filter in. We put a bigger filter. We let the fan go. It was about two or three months before my mom came by. She came by. She was in the house for two or three hours. She was convinced that we finally kicked the dogs out of the house and they weren't even around. So it made that much of a difference. That was, what, 18 years ago that uh, we have now been running our furnace for 24-7, 365, that the filter or the fan has just been going nonstop. So um, I've kind of played around that with a lot, but just to give you background, filters, I, I, they're really designed to protect the furnace. This is the inside of a furnace. When you don't have a good filter, it's going to start filling in parts that really air needs to flow through for efficiency. And it can actually start to damage the filters because things are going to overheat. They're not going to get even temperature distribution. So it can cause a lot of damage to, to a, a furnace. You have different types of furnace filters. You have just your standard filter. You have a, a pleated filter. A lot of times these are referred to as 30 days, 90 days. And then you have what's called a high efficiency filter. So the main difference on, on these filters is, is how much airflow they're going to go through and the particle size that can get through them. That's obviously the main difference here. This is just going to filter out the big stuff. This is what most furnace and HVAC guys will recommend because this puts the least amount of strain on your furnace, allows the maximum airflow, but it doesn't really do anything for air quality. It's really just protecting the furnace. 
these are really meant for, you know, like this one's called the ultra allergen. So it's super small filter sizes. But what it's going to do is it's going to restrict airflow because it's trying to move it through all these little teeny air spaces. And so, yes, this will improve air quality, but it's going to make your furnace work a little bit harder. So these are called high efficiency because these have more surface area. So the way to kind of think of why the difference here, let's say you take a piece of paper and you punch a bunch of holes in it. You can only punch so many holes in that paper where before they start overlapping and then you don't have that small filter size. Well, if you wanna make a smaller hole or get more holes so that more air can go through it, the way you do that is make your paper bigger and then fold it like an accordion. So the surface area allows for more of those holes where air can flow through. So that's why this is called a high efficiency because it's, it doesn't burden the furnace as much as this one does, but this one, so this one might have quadrupled airflow, but the same particle filtration, if that makes sense. So this is really the best. Now, I, when I started teaching this class, I would get a lot of feedback. Hey, I talked to my heating guy and he says, you're totally wrong. Yes, and that's one thing to keep in mind is that if you're just focused on the furnace health, install these, change them every 30 days. That's the best thing for your furnace health. But if you want to kind of double duty on your furnace, yes, it's going to put a little bit more wear on your furnace. But that was kind of what my initial, that initial article I read is you can buy a room purifier. So, you know, maybe the size of this, this room, you might spend four or $500 on a purifier for a decent sized room. Or you might just use your furnace. Yeah, you're going to spend a little bit in filters and maybe you burn out the motor. But what does a new furnace motor cost you? About four or $500. So you can get your whole house filtration for about the same cost of what you just would be getting with one room purifier. Um, okay, those are pleated. We talked about that. Now you also hear about electronic air filters. And uh, basically how that's working is there's some sort of pre-filter that's really just getting the big things out. But then there is, uh, for those of you old enough to remember the tube TVs that would get all static electricity on the screen and it would just accumulate a bunch of dust. That's kind of what's happening. It creates a static charge and really small particles are gonna to attract to it. So it's really good for filtering out very small particles. You have a few different kinds. You know, this is kind of the older standard. These are what the newer ones look like. And then you have a retrofit. Same concept. You have kind of the, the cheaper 30-day filter material and then a screen. And that screen acts as that static charge. So these work great. They're amazing for improving your air quality. I don't recommend them 99% of the time because, for example, this one, you're probably, if you're in a position that you need to be improving your air quality, you're probably going to be changing this about every three weeks, which means you have to pull it apart, disassemble it, replace that side and that side with new media, and then wipe down this one, let it all dry really good, put it all back together, put it all back into your furnace. I don't see anyone, every, every time I see one of these, it's, you might as well just not even been using a filter or just get the 30-day filter because it's probably doing the same thing. It's either super clogged because no one's done anything with it, and then you're even putting more strain on your filter, or it's, you know, it, it's just damaged and not even doing anything. Same concept with these ones. These are very expensive up front. These older style are a pain because you had to, you had to try to clean them, which usually involved a small brush and you're brushing out and, and error that you're blowing things. The newer ones are a little bit nicer. You can pull them out. You can put them in a dishwasher. But still, you think about, they still recommend this about every four to six weeks. And so it's July. Oh, we got to shut down the system. Got to pull this all apart. Let it wash in the dishwasher. Let it dry. Make sure it's good and dry before I put it back together. So I've been without air conditioning for half the day. Again, this never gets done. So if you're the type of person that can diligently maintain these, they're great. 99% of the population is not, so that's why I don't recommend them. There's one other thing that these can do, especially these ones. Um, let's see if we go back to this picture here. What can sometimes happen is because there's an electric charge going through this, if a, 
bigger piece of debris gets lodged in there, it actually starts arcing and it creates ozone. Ozone is also something we shouldn't be breathing on a regular basis. Ozone is what they use to get rid of odors and you know they put ozonators in homes that have had a fire damage or a lot of tobacco smoke smell. It, it's, it's very reactive. It's, it's not healthy for our lungs to be breathing. And I've, I've been in homes where I walk in and you have an electronic filter you're not maintaining. You can just smell the ozone in the house and that's not healthy. That's and that's usually caused by one of these that have not been well maintained. So I'm not a fan of electronic filters. Um, I just don't see them being very well maintained. Um, okay, just last thing on furnace filters. We had a basement apartment. Uh, tenants didn't really tell us that there was a leak that had been going on for some time until it got some of their clothes. Anyway, big mold problem behind the dishwasher. Dishwasher hose had been leaking for a long time. Pulled it all out, mold everywhere. Had a company come out, they cleaned it all up. And I, you know, talking to the guy, I worked with it for a few years and just said, okay, what, what do we need to do to keep the air so we're not having a problem with mold in the air and everything? And I said, can we rent one of those air scrubbers from you just to purify the air? So you hear that term air scrubber, which is basically just a big, heavy duty, more industrial sized room purifier that's moving a ton of air. And he said, you know, Jared, that's really just a fan moving through a filter. He said, what? He's like, I can get you one. He says, but you can probably with this smaller living space, you could probably get just as much benefit. Go and get a box fan. They're usually 20 by 20. Buy one of those nicer furnace filters that are usually 20 by 20 and duct tape it onto it. And then just set that in the room and let it go. And it's going to start circulating the air and it's going to trap things in the filter. We did that and did mold testing later. Everything was clean, but I've used that a lot over the years. So those days when pollen counts are super high, my daughter is starting to have all that hay fever. I'll just get the box fan and stick it in her bedroom at night. And it's circulating the air and pulling everything out and makes a huge difference. Um, my, my wife's family had a cabin out by starvation. And until we got some weather stripping and everything, every time the wind blows, which is all the time out there, it, we'd, we'd come in, it, we'd spend an hour and a half just wiping down and getting dusting the whole place. And so we started doing that. We, we, we knew we were gonna be coming out about three weeks later. So we grabbed a fan and we stuck a filter on it and we just let it go and we got back and that filter was dirty and there wasn't hardly any dust in the cabin. So that can make a big difference. So I'm a big fan of just leveraging these filters and using them. Now, one of the arguments I always get is, yeah, but your electricity bill is going to go up. And yes, that's true. But it would kind of be going up similarly if you were plugging in a room purifier. You're still using electricity for that. But modern furnaces have improved quite a bit. And so I've been doing this. I had an old, old furnace. We've been doing it for a while. And we, we did some upgrades and we got a uh, a new blower fan. We had to put in a new blower fan. And so I had the chance to look at, okay, what is the new technology? And they're called ECM motors. So it's a DC voltage versus AC voltage. They're a lot more energy efficient. They're variable speed. So I took the old, the specs on the old one compared to the new one. And the old one, basically, if I did all the calculations at the time, it was about $700 a year to run continuously. And the new one was about $75 a year to run continuously. So yes, you're, you're gonna be costing more electricity. If you, have a, if you have a high efficiency furnace built in the last 10, 15 years, you probably have one of these already installed. Um, some of the contractor grade ones, most everything in the last 10 years is probably has one of these newer, newer blower fans. So the electricity side of it, not as big of a deal. And worst case scenario is spend 400 bucks and upgrade your blower fan. And, and then it's not, it's gonna pay for itself in the first couple of years, if not first year. There's our second word. So make sure to write that down. Don't time well, we're gonna cruise through here. Okay, very small particles. Um, Limit use of candles, indoor smoking, don't burn your dinner. Um, but then again, using your furnace filter is going to take care of a lot of that. Allergens, so dust mites, we talked about, how do you deal with those? 
Number one is getting rid of the dust. That's their food source. Number two is to get rid of their environment. So washing your bedding in hot water is critical. And, and that kind of can be harder than some people realize. So for example, 130 degrees, most water heaters are set at 130 degrees. Well, if your laundry room is upstairs and your water heater's in the basement, by the time that, even though you set it on hot water, by the time it gets that tub full, it's probably not hot water anyway. So again, that's why in our family, especially after all this, most of our sheets are white, so we can add bleach, which will also help kill uh, dust mites. Uh, stuffed animals, um, the, the kids' blankies, just those things are going to harbor these dust mites. Um, you know, so we use the phrase, if it's not washable, it's disposable, and don't leave it around for very long. Um, the hypoallergenic pillow covers and, and mattress covers, that's really what, that's why it's hypoallergenic, is the dust mites can't get through it. And so if you have that hypoallergenic cover on the mattress, washing the, the sheets is going to get rid of that environment, where if you don't, they could be into the mattress. I, I haven't verified it, but I have read a few anecdotal things where mattresses, they've weighed mattresses 10 years after and before, and they weigh more than when you bought them. <laughs> Lots going into that. Um, vacuuming regularly. Uh, obviously, we're going to kind of skip to this because we're getting a little bit behind on time. Cockroaches. Um, it's it, a lot of people are allergic to cockroaches. And luckily here in Utah, we don't have a huge problem with cockroaches. Um, but, uh, I do remember we did that allergen test. This was a while ago, kind of when the market crashed and a lot of homes were, you know, being rented out and yeah, a lot of things, you know, 2009, 2010, we did a $2 million property over by the golf course on the other side of the lake. And, and it tested off the charts for cockroach allergens when we, when we did the allergen test. So you, you never know where you're going to find it. Um, VOCs. So really pay attention if, to uh, the cleaning supplies that you're using. Um, buy anything that's green or low VOC. Um, research construction materials. If you know or, you, or you're worried about VOC, you know, look at the content and where you're getting the, the, the flooring material and the paints that you're using and the carpeting. All of those things can have different uh, VOC quantities. Um, another one, which is starting, you hear more and more about green dry cleaners. Well, that was another thing, a big study where people were feeling fatigued and feeling down. And it, were, it was these business executives that were wearing dry cleaned clothes every day. And they get home, and they change, oh, and they feel so much better. But, oh, work, I just feel. And they started finding that a lot of it was the dry cleaning chemicals that they were constantly being exposed to. So oh, there's our next word. Okay, humidity. We want to control humidity. We've talked a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of high and low humidity. High humidity, really, we live in a drier climate. So the only time we're really worried about high humidity is one is if you use a swamp cooler and you're not using it correctly. Um, it, just on that note, if you have a swamp cooler, what I recommend is getting a hygrometer, which is like a thermometer, but it measures uh, humidity rather than temperature. And if that humidity is over 50% with a swamp cooler, then you don't have enough windows open. A swamp cooler works by replacing the warm air with cold air. And if it can't replace it, but just adds to it, humidity levels will go up. So it's a great thing with those rentals. Go and install one and just tell the tenants, look, you'll be more comfortable if you keep this number under 50%. If it goes over 50, you don't have enough windows open. You need to open more windows. And you can direct that airflow to cool off the back side of the house, or the front side of the house. So that's the best way. Exhaust fans are the other ones in bathrooms. If you aren't using that exhaust fan, it's going to have higher humidity and lead to mold and other, other issues. Lower humidity, um, main thing there is, is a whole house humidifier does great. Um, you see more and more of those. Um, ideal indoor humidity is, is around 40%. If you can maintain 40%, you're gonna be healthier things are just going to work better. But when it gets really cold, humidity drops. And so that's where, um, that, that's where you can install a whole house humidifier. This is the original or kind of what most people have. 
basically it's a pad where water trickles down and warm air adds humidity into the furnace system. If you have one of these and you're worried about air quality, this pad should be replaced every fall. Every time before you start up the furnace, that needs to be replaced because it starts to grow stuff. We see that all the time and rarely do we see that they're maintained. Newer humidifiers that I would recommend are now steam generated. So it's just a little reservoir and it boils the water and pumps the steam into a home much more sterile, much more uh, if you're worried about air quality and not just the humidity. Okay, we're gonna kind of jump through some of these things. Okay, so obviously we've talked about a lot of things and we're not saying all of these need to be done, but if you do suffer from you know, some of these allergies or these other air quality issues, Pick some and start because if you can just get below that threshold, like we talked about, you might start to see some huge improvements in just overall lifestyle and, and health. Um, okay, so what we talked about, there are a few other things. If you've kind of exhausted all of your avenues with the low budget air quality stuff, there are other things that you can do to improve air quality. And one of the biggest ones is ventilation. And so this has actually been around for you know, 20, 30 years. Um, what's called an HRV or an ERV. And that's probably the most common one. It used to be that an HRV was for cold climates and an ERV was for humid climates. But the whole idea is you want to open up the window, but in the wintertime, you don't want the cold. If you're down in Florida in the summertime, you don't want the heat and the, the humidity coming in. And so basically what it is, is there's a heat exchanger which pulls warm, stale air from the house, it pulls fresh, cool air from the outside, and the warmth is used to heat it back up. So you're getting warmer, fresh air into the house, and you're exhausting out that stale air. And so it's like having a window open without all of the downsides of energy efficiency. This used to be, it's not, you don't hear about it as much because until about five, eight years ago, this used to be a five to $15,000 upgrade. It was integrated into the ductwork. Um, seems like it was about five, eight years ago, Panasonic was the first one I was aware of, and it looked like a large bathroom exhaust fan. So rather than kind of a 12 by 12 little vent, it was more like a 18 by 18 vent up in the ceiling. And the first time I saw it was in the living room, and it was like, why on earth did they put, and it was this huge multi-million dollar house, and they had it in the living room. It's like, why on earth would you put an exhaust fan in the living room? Well, it, it was this, and it was built in. Um, and so there, and it was just a duct going in and a duct going out. And so a lot easier, it was more of a thousand dollar install um, versus the, the five, six, seven thousand dollar install. So these are becoming more affordable. Um, another one that we'll sometimes see is um, more powerful exhaust fans or whole house fans. We don't see a ton of those. Uh, the fire department community, that whole industry doesn't like whole house fans because if there was a whole house fan, the idea is a fan usually up, installed in the ceiling upstairs and it opens up and it just sucks all the air out of the house into the attic space, um, which works great um, unless you have a fire start somewhere and then it's just going to suck the fire through the whole house and the house is gone. So Fire department side of things, that's the only negative I really hear about them, um, but they do great, especially if you live in the foothills where you have cooler evenings. Um, the sun bakes the, the house all day long. You've got the attic just cooking up there. My brother has one, and, and when he bought the house, we talked a lot with the seller, and that's how you'd use it. He had a thermometer up in the attic, and he would watch kind of what the temperatures were in the attic. He'd watch the temperatures, what they were on the outside, and when all right, I the outside just dropped below 70. I want it 70 in the house. It's 140 in the attic. He'd crank that on, open up the windows in the basement, and he'd get fresh air in the house. It would cool off the attic so that the air conditioner was running less through the evening. So a lot of benefits doing that way. And I've, you know, I've seen people rig up you know, devices that will automate all of that. And then, whether it's a smart home, I'm sure it's coming there. But but the, the, the powerful and the whole house fans are, are great, um, a great thing to, to take advantage of. Um, I think there's some more slides in here that talk more about just other HVAC stuff, but not as applicable for here in our climate, more for humidity. Um, oh, sorry, that was uh, 
That's our last word. We are almost out of time, so that's our last keyword. Um, just one, and when you live in a really humid climate, having the air conditioner act as a dehumidifier and everything makes a big difference. Not as applicable here in our part of the country, but what does make a difference is we talked about that whole leaving that fan running 24 seven, especially if you live like in a townhouse. You know, some of these are, are four levels of a townhouse. And in the summertime, that basement lower level is gonna be freezing and you're gonna be cooking in the upstairs. And so that's one other thing we've noticed is just having that, that fan going all the time is going to keep that airflow moving and it helps the house be a little more comfortable. So you might be losing a little bit more uh, on uh, electricity because you're running that fan 24 seven, but as far as the heating or the electricity, especially in the summertime, it's a more moderate temperature. Um, and so you're making some savings that way. Okay, I think that is everything I want to cover. Usually I'll say, yeah, ask any questions, but uh, if you do have questions, post them in the chat, but uh, we will get you guys all credit for attending and you can are welcome to send me any questions. Um, and as always, I always tell the agents, we're there to uh, be a resource. So if you have clients or questions or things that come up as you're working with your clients, we want to be a resource that, uh, you know, not just there for the inspection. I tell my guys all the time that the inspection is just a means to an end. And the end for us is educating clients about their home. And so that's what we're there for is to help educate them and help them know about the home. So thank you for attending today. Thanks, Jared. Purple air and all of these outdoor air quality monitors that you can now get and place around. I've seen one with, um, I can't figure out how to stop the share on this. <laughs> um, there's uh, one of the radon air things uh -huh. has a residential radon monitor that's smart, hooked up to an app and it will measure mm -hmm. air quality um, for the radon, but mostly focused on radon. Okay. Um, and I've seen some other ones that will measure particulates, which, you know, that, I don't know, a lot of people use that as a baseline that if they go through and you have a lot of particulates, your air quality is bad. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily. I mean, that's one of the things when I go to any of these mold conferences or mold trainings is here in Utah, because of our dry climate, we just on average have more mold in the air. And so our particulates are always higher. And so for example, the standard is we, you, you collect 150 milliliters whenever you do a mold sample. Mm -hmm. But here in Utah, 75 is sometimes is, is usually what we do because doing 150, sometimes it cloud, there's too much captured. Oh, wow. And so, so yeah, so the, the air, the particulates is one that I always hear about. And I've had people come to my house to do demonstrations and they use a little device and it measures particulates. Yeah. It's like, well, Right. Yeah, I mean, it's windy outside and summertime and the wind's blowing, it, you're so going to have a lot. Factors. So that one I'm not so sure about, but uh, but yeah, the VOCs is another one. We just started, we haven't started off, you know, officially offering it, but we have all the equipment, um, a newer company where it measures, measures measurement for VOCs. Another one that a lot of people don't realize is mold creates VOCs. Hmm. So sometimes people will have allergic reactions to mold. We'll do a mold test and there's no spores in the air but you could have mold growing in the walls and the spores haven't got out, but the gases that the molds emit, some people are allergic to. Interesting. So it's another level of testing that we can see, do you have a mold problem based on the gases that are in the air, not the spores that are in the air. But then, it, so we did one for, we, we started doing it because we had a client that was, you know, allergic to everything, you know, walks by someone with too much perfume and is down for a day, you know, that wow. type of sensitivity. And so we did all these tests, but it was pretty cool because we could even see wow, it was really high in these types of VOCs. And those are usually where we're found in glues and stuff. And we back to sort of, oh yeah, we re the bathroom, mm -hmm. you know, last week. So it's very sensitive to, you know, to, to pick up yeah. all of those kinds of things. That's crazy. So cool. the sky's the limit when it comes to, do you want to test? Yeah. <laughs> but, Tests for every... but yeah, so is the price tag on some of those. So. Right.
X. Okay. Steven and Sherry, I'm going to quit this. Did you guys both get the Google form downloaded so I can end the Zoom? I just submitted mine, so you should see mine. Okay. All right. And Stephen, you have it downloaded? I can't hear you, but I think that's a yes. Okay. All right, perfect. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I just submitted my form.